The House will come to order. Members will be at their seats. The clerk has opened the roll and you may record your presence. Please rise and give your attention to the House Chaplain, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Representative Francis. Good morning, friends. Allow me to pray for you. Dear Father, in the book of Psalms we read, In thee, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In thy righteousness deliver me and rescue me. Incline thine ear to me and save me. Be thou to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless man. Father, today as we look at the myriad of things facing us, we truly want to find a refuge in you. We're about to enter into much debate and deliberation. When the votes are recorded and we are able to look back, help us to have acted in such a way as we can be pleased. I pray that every discussion participated in and every vote that is recorded will find decisions based on what is right and just. Sharpen our minds as we look closely at that which will be put before us. Might everything we do be shrouded in your righteousness. And for the person who just might be getting on our nerves a bit, help us to extend grace even when it's not returned or even acknowledged. Might our satisfaction come from knowing that you know our hearts and why we do what we do. We do pray for the sick and vulnerable in our individual communities. Bring resources and resourcers to their aid, I pray. I also pray for the families of each one gathered here in this chamber of decision. Give them patience with the long days and seemingly endless meetings that demand our attention, the attention which many times rightly belongs to them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Which is stands, a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and Have all the members had the opportunity to record their presence? The clerk will close the roll and record the attendance.
The speaker recognizes Representative Beeler for on a point of personal privilege. Okay. So I would invite uh, any Vietnam veterans down here if you want to come down. We're here to recognize a Vietnam veteran today. Um, and I'm joined at the well. So colleagues, thank, colleagues, thank you for your attention this morning and on this special occasion as we recognize a truly great Kansan, the late Colonel Roger H.C. Donlan, the first recipient of the Medal of Honor during the Vietnam War. Today I'm joined at the, at the well by Mrs. Norma Donlan, the widow of Colonel Donlan. I'm not gonna to try to point to all of them, but uh, retired Colonel Mike and June Neer, Justine Donlan Jeschke, and Jordan Donlan, both granddaughters of Colonel Donlan, Jackie Flores, a family friend, Deborah Crater from the Topeka VA Caregiver Program, Kevin Reagan and Art Fillmore, attorneys and, and friends of the family, and then Pat Warren, who's the spouse of Senator Kelly Warren and the president of the Kansas Speedway in CASA. So in, and in the gallery, um, I'd like to recognize uh, Terry Buckler, the president of Special Forces Association Chapter 29, Frank Goss and his guest Betty, and Frank happened to be a CGSC instructor for my son-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel Brandon Lundgren, and Amy Nooch is up there as well. So before I begin reading the citation, uh, the Medal of Honor, for those of you who don't know, is the United States' highest award for military valor in action. The first Medal of Honor was awarded in 1861, and there have been 3,536 Medals of Honor awarded, 618 of which have been awarded posthumously. And there were also 235 recipients of the Medal of Honor during the Vietnam War. So today, we are here to welcome Mrs. Donlan, her family and friends to the Kansas State Capitol to honor the legacy of her husband, the late Colonel Roger H.C. Donlan. He was the first recipient of the Medal of Honor during the Vietnam War, a truly remarkable Kansas citizen from Leavenworth, and Colonel Donlan was also the first Special Forces member to be a recipient of the Medal of Honor. And today, I want, as we pay tribute to him, I'd like to read an excerpt from his Medal of Honor ceremony presentation. And this is from December 5th, 1964. And this is, you were present, Mrs. Donlin, Senator Hayden, Senator Keating, Senator Lick, mother, sorry, I'm sorry, messed that up. Senator Lick Kennedy, Secretary McNamara, ladies and gentlemen. This is a proud moment for all Americans. We are here today to present this nation's highest honor to Captain Roger H.C. Donlin, United States Army. On July 6th of this year, Captain Donlan was the commanding officer of the United States Army Special Forces Team A-726 at Camp Nam Dong, Vietnam, in the Republic of South Vietnam. Under cover of night, a reinforced Viet Cong battalion launched a full-scale attack on the camp. A violent battle took place lasting five hours. The Viet Cong enemy used mortars, grenades, and heavy enemy gunfire. Captain Donlan was wounded four times, in the stomach, in the leg, in the shoulder and in the face. Wounded though he was, Captain Donlan directed a successful defense of the camp. He moved from post to post and man to man within the camp perimeter. Despite his multiple wounds, Captain Donlan, with great courage and coolness, inspired the American personnel and their friendly Vietnamese troops to a successful defense of their camp. No one who has seen military service will fail to appreciate and understand the magnitude of Captain Donlan's heroic performance under enemy fire and in the darkness. This Medal of Honor, awarded in the name of Congress, is the first such honor to be bestowed upon an American military man for conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty in our present efforts in the Republic of Vietnam. So next week, Governor Kelly has proclaimed April 10th to be, 2024, to be Colonel Roger H.C. Donlan Day. And today, I present this certificate to Mrs. Donlan, and it reads as follows. State of Kansas, House of Representatives, 
in recognition and grateful memory for his exceptional gallantry, inspirational leadership, and courage under heavy enemy fire on July 6, 1964, while successfully leading the defense of his forces at Camp Nam Dong in the Republic of Vietnam, the entire membership extends its appreciation for his exemplary service to the United States. Mr. Speaker, I request my words be spread across the journal. This is for me. Without objection, so ordered. Messages from the Senate, the clerk will read. The Senate adopts the conference committee report to agree to disagree on House Bill 2465 and has appointed Senators Tyson Peck and Holland as second conferees on part of the Senate. Representatives Humphreys, Lewis, and Osmond are appointed to replace Representatives Concannon, Johnson, and Owsley as conferees on House Bill 2070. Representatives Adam Smith, Bergkamp, and Sawyer are appointed to replace Representatives Sutton, Penn, and Neighbor as conferees on House Bill 2097. Are there announcements? Seeing none, the speaker recognizes the majority leader for a motion to recess. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Republicans, we will calendar in the old Supreme Court immediately upon recess. Mr. Speaker, I move the House stand in recess until 10.45 a.m. You've heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The House is in recess.
House will be in order. The Speaker recognizes Representative Adam Smith for a motion to adopt the Agree to Disagree Report for House Bill 2465. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 2465, or the, the Conference Committee report for this bill. Uh, just want to explain what the contents are. It contains House Bill 2757, which is the adoption savings account bill that passed uh, this chamber on March 27th, 123 to 0. Uh, it also includes the contents of Senate Bill 498, which is the adoption tax credit the, and the Pregnancy Resource Act. Um, I can go into details if there's any questions, but that are those are the provisions that are within the uh, conference committee report. So uh, I'll stand for questions. Is there discussion? Seeing none, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I move to adopt the Agree to Disagree Conference Committee report and that a new conference committee be appointed. You've heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The ayes, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion passes. The Speaker appoints Representative Adam Smith, Bergkamp, and Sawyer as conferees on part of the House. Speaker recognizes Representative Hoheisel for a motion to concur in conference on House Bill 2577. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 2577 was the state treasurer's bill, just allows the state treasurer to move um, unclaimed property funds more easily from, from the CAPERS fund over. Um, the Senate made one change. It was just a date change. We went to conference. We take a look at it. We agree with them. So, Mr. Speaker, I move that the House concur and send amendments to HB 2577, which is in conference. For discussion, the Speaker recognizes Representative Shu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bill's good. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Close. This constitutes final action on House Bill 2577. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. as every member had the opportunity to record their vote. The clerk will close the roll. Representative Lewis votes aye. Are there, does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 120 having voted in favor and two against the passage of House Bill 2577, the same having received a constitutional majority of the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. Are there announcements? Speaker recognizes Representative Stock still. Democrats, we will resume agenda meeting at 12 o'clock, 152 South. 12 o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the uh, members of the Appropriations Subcommittee to study contract nursing. We will still meet today at noon. We have a uh, report to formulate uh, based on the last three days, so 
I will see you in room 582 at noon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pro Tem, um, House and Senate Judiciary will have conference committee meeting in 582 upon the adjournment of whichever chamber adjourns second. Thank you. Seeing no further announcements, the Speaker recognizes the Majority Leader for a motion to recess. Hey, Republicans, we are going to calendar at 12 o'clock in the old Supreme Court. As a question was asked, I would recommend getting an early lunch. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move the House stand in recess until 12.30 p.m. You've all heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The House is in recess.
The House will be in order. The speaker recognizes Representative Christy Williams for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 387. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, first, I'll take a moment to explain the CCR package. It includes the full constitutional funding and historic special education funding, which includes $77.5 million of new special education money. It also includes a total of $309 million in new education funding. It also amends the at-risk portions of the bill and delays it in one year. And it also maintains necessary accountability with the commitment of this constitutional funding. Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt the conference committee report and I'll stand for questions. Is there discussion? Seeing none, Representative, nope. Representative Wynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there were tweaks made. Um, there is new funding. It is tied, contingent upon the LOB component. It's not enough. Please vote no. Representative Younger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here we go again, same song, second verse. I'll, I'll talk about it in a different order this time. Um, it just, I'm not gonna remind you about the characteristics of an at-risk student other than you know, an at-risk student, it's so, several issues, socioeconomic issues, behavioral issues, attendance issues, emotional challenges, lack of parental support, learning difficulties, transience, substance abuse, limited English profici proficiency. Kids come to school with these issues. They're not manifested at, in school. They come to school with so many of these issues. And teachers deal with these every single day. Every single day they deal with these issues before they can teach the academic subjects oftentimes. The answer to this at risk isn't to take money away, it's, it's to support the schools. Special Education Interim Committee. This is the best education committee we have. It needs to continue, simple as that. Let those people meet. Let them come back with their recommendations. See what they have to say. Let them come back. The funding. Again, I said this before. No district receives more in special ed state aid than their actual expenses. Counting local option budget is robbing Peter to pay Paul. And I admit, there is new money. I, 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 I apologize if I didn't get this correct last time. I did not mean to mislead anybody. But there is $77.5 million new money in this. That's a fact. That's a fact. I can't dispute that. But some of the other new money, the $228 million, that's for the base state aid. That's a statutory obligation, the CPI increase. That's what that is. That's not new money. That's money that's coming in that's supposed to be there. 
County and LOB money is not new money. It's local money. And I stand by my claim that this is voodoo math. Now, from constituents, I've heard that constituents, hey, they're quiet on this. Hey, you know, they're, they're okay with it. Well, let me tell you, I've heard from your constituents. I've heard from people from Liberal, Leewood, Olathe, Hayes, Elkhart, Johnson City, Scott City, Holcomb, Yugaton, Sublette, Garden City, Emporia, Dodge City, Syracuse, Russell, Valley Falls, Pittsburgh, Oakley, Brewster, Shiland, Golden Plains, Healy, Hill City, Hoxie, Oberlin, Quinter, Rollins County, Sharon Springs, St. Francis, Tri Plains, Wauquini, Wheatland, Brown County Special Education Interlocal, Newton, Heston, Halstead, Paola, DeSoto, Wichita, Shawnee Mission, Moscow, Olathe, Great Bend, Ellenwood, Poisington, Blue Valley, Altoona, Ulysses, High Plains at Ulysses, Chanute, Crest, Erie, Ellis, La Crosse, Victoria, Humboldt, Iola, Marymount Valley, Yates Center, Holton, Satanta, Curry Hills, Onega, Jackson Heights, Royal Valley, Colby, Lenexa, Goodland, Phillipsburg, Hutchinson, Nickerson, South Hutchinson, Fairfield, Pretty Prairie, Haven, Bueller, Wichita, Garner, Ashland, Flint Hills Cooperative, Marion, Abilene, Manhattan, Jefferson West, Junction City, Salina, Shawnee, Leewood, Marshall Nemaha Educational Service Center, and Augusta. I've heard from them, and they've all said no. No to Senate Bill 387. That's what they've told me. And I know that they've told you that, too, because most of these were emails, a carbon copy to me. So trust your constituents. Also yesterday, the Kansas Association of Special Edu Administrators, KNEA, United School Administrators of Kansas, Kansas Association of School Boards, and the K Kansas State Board of Education all said no to Senate Bill 387. Right before I came down here, I received a letter. And this is probably, I, I hope, I hope that uh, you'll listen, you'll pay attention, because this, this parent can say this, it says this better than I can. Greetings. It's Crosby's mom again. If you're receiving this, it's because you have, at some point, given me hope about special education funding in the state of Kansas either through your voting record, your advice to me, to just keep showing up and keep using your voice, or receiving it because you showed kindness when my six-year-old had a meltdown in front of the house last year on World Down Syndrome Day. Or you've given me hope through your social media presence or advised me on the process of how to advocate for resources for all kids in Kansas who need extra support. or you're one of the parents fighting the good fight with me, or you failed to show up for a meeting that I drove two hours to make. Whatever reason I've added you to this list, I'm writing because I desperately need you to hear my voice and the voice of other parents whose kids are in special education in Kansas. I received a call yesterday from a reporter asking about my thoughts on the current proposal for funding special ed in Topeka through Senate Bill 387. My primary thoughts are that I'm disappointed, sad, frustrated, and tired. I've been challenged through the current proposal should be something I'm happy about because there's funding for special ed. I'm always very aware that it will become as a trade-off for chronically underfunded special ed. Changing the algorithm using local tax dollars so it appears the funding is there is not the answer for our under-resourced schools. If you're concerned that some districts are funded over the 90% threshold, I would invite you to do some research into the special ed cooperatives 
and how they operate and review the per child costs for services in rural areas with fewer children seeking services. I've been reminded that we have legal rights. I can file complaints if my son's IEP is not met. I can't seem to get anyone to understand that it is not the letter of the law or the menace in the IP that are the issue. School districts will do what they can to meet the bare minimum. It is all the other things that go into making a successful life for a child with special needs. The million things not in the IP are the issue. A few stories from my friends. It is the learning tub that gets used in general education to fill time that no one realized needs to be refreshed. Surely it is only two 15-minute two sessions a day, but when it takes six months until someone realizes that that has not been refreshed, it means a loss of learning for students, for all students. It's the little things that lead to what is commonly referred to as by our families as a lost year. This is my son's only chance at his developmental milestones. They take longer and we work harder for them. We're in our fourth year of potty training at home and at school. School districts are doing everything they can with the funding they have to meet the needs. This is coming at the cost of mental health, of special education, and the paras we do. Representative, there has been objection to you reading. Thank you. And I will close that this is from Crosby's mom. And I will close, Mr. Speaker, with this. Arnold Schwarzenegger was recently asked about artificial intelligence. He was. I'm not as concerned about artificial intelligence as I am about basic stupidity. Real life stupidity worries me more than AI. Let's fully fund special education with a clean special education funding bill. Thank you. Speaker recognizes Representative Howell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. But prior to this session, I had met with uh, many uh, special ed uh, folks in, uh, in my district. Um, I got to see kind of what goes on in the classroom, and I got to see some of the challenges that my school district faces. In, in trying to learn more about this uh, school finance formula and how the special ed funding is uh, appropriated, it can be very confusing, and I do appreciate the chair taking much time with me uh, trying to understand the contents of this bill. However, I, I am not convinced that changing the special ed statute is the appropriate way to go. Currently, my school district has to reappropriate $5.4 million from the general ed population of students to satisfy the federal and state uh, mandates as it relates to special ed. Uh, I, I know the school finance formula expires in 2027, and I think that's something we need to look at, but I just think at this day, at this hour, I am not convinced that is the way to go. So I will be voting no on SB 387. Thank you. Representative Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Body, this is one of the more difficult bills that 
you would have to understand this year. I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a town in Kansas. Let's call it Anywhere, Kansas. And it's got three businesses in the town. One business is called LeBron Sports Shop. Another business is called The General Store. And the third business is called World Market. All three of these businesses are managed by a gentleman by the name of Pete. We'll call him Pete the Cat. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> These three businesses are all owned by a group of investors. And Pete the Cat has had a really good year. It's the end of the fiscal year. Pete does a great job. These businesses are thriving. And in fact, they have a 33% net gain for the year. Now, Pete's a little worried about this because he relies on investors to give him money to, to expand his businesses. And so he comes up with this bright idea. Pete says, world market's going to make nothing this year. We're going to take the money that is generated off a of world market, and we're going to put it into LeBron's sports shop and the general store. And that way, we can say that world market needs more investor money. Now, by now, you're probably realizing that I'm doing an analogy of what goes on with LOB money in our current system. For the last seven years, the LOB money that has been generated off of the excess cost of special education students has gone not into the special education fund, where it should rightly go, but it has gone into the general fund or the athletic fund or the increase of salary for the superintendent fund, or whatever fund the local district wants to do. Now, I know many of you have gotten letters from school boards and superintendents saying, keep the status quo. We like it. I encourage you to put special ed money where it belongs with special ed kids. My brother is an autistic adult now, and so special ed is really personal to me. And I fought hard to get the increases put into special ed. And previous speakers that have denigrated the amount of money put in for special education is somewhat offensive to me. I want to see special ed fully funded. I want to see those kids taken care of. And I don't believe that hiding special ed money other places does that. I think increasing our responsibility for special ed and at the same time, cleaning up what local districts do with special ed generated money makes sense. And I encourage you to look past the rhetoric, look past the army of people that have written letters, the army of organizations, and let's focus on funding special ed, taking care of kids. Is this a perfect bill? No, we haven't seen one of those yet in this body, have we? Are there still things that need to be fixed? Yes. But I encourage you to vote for special ed, vote for fully funding special ed, and vote yes on 387. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close.
Thank you, Mr. Lead Mr. Leader. And this is your opportunity today to vote in favor of kids, special education kids, general education kids. You can say you did your part to approve special education increases as well as general education increases. It is the responsible answer. It is the transparent and accountable answer in the changes that we've made, in the accountability that we have included. And I would ask you to stand with kids, stand with adding the money that's constitutional and historic, especially for special ed education kids. So I, uh, Mr. Leader, I close and move my motion. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 387. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. Has every member had the opportunity to record their vote? The clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 65 having voted in favor and 58 against the passage of Senate Bill 387, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. Speaker recognizes Representative Waymaster for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 18. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Senate Bill 18 uh, was actually, uh, has the contents of Senate Bill 552 that was passed by the Senate. And uh, we had a conference committee yesterday uh, because we have not seen Senate Bill 552. It was sent over to the House very late. Um, but it is of an important matter that we have actually discussed for many years, and that is in regards to uh, the higher education deferred maintenance, uh, which has been plaguing our universities, community colleges, technical schools, and also our municipal university for many, many years. In fact, the uh, amount of deferred maintenance in that particular higher education system is reaching a point of $1.3 billion. So Senate Bill uh, 18 uh, creates the Kansas Campus Restoration Act and authorizing the Kansas Board of Regents to adopt rules and regulations regarding deferred maintenance and demolition of facilities for our um, higher institutions. Uh, all expenditures that would be administered through the Board of Regents to our six Regent universities would require a one-to-one -one match. Uh, the bill also requires that there would, no be, there would not be a match in regards to our community colleges, technical colleges, uh, municipal university, and institute of technology, or from the state education institution's deferred maintenance account. Uh, the amount of the transfer starting in fiscal year 2026 would be uh, $30 million for the uh, institutions, the regent schools, and then $2.7 million uh, for the community colleges, technical colleges, and municipal universities um, in fiscal year 2026, and that runs uh, through the uh, bill through uh, 2031. Uh, with this bill, when it passed the Senate, uh, the vote was 34 to 6, and so therefore, Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt the con con conference committee report on Senate Bill 18, and I stand for questions. For discussion, the Speaker recognizes Representative Helgerson. Previous speaker described the bill very adequately. Uh, I think most of you are in favor of uh, demolishing the buildings on campus so that they can be replaced with a newer building. And I urge you, if that's the case, to support the bill. Representative Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senate Bill 18 is a bill, I think it's just really a bridge too far, that you have to realize that K through, or not K through 12, but higher education, these institutions on their own have budgets of $800, $900 million alone individually. 
The state is just a small part of the money that they have. The way any institution gets in the, in the problem of deferred maintenance, it's a self-inflicted injury. It's not something we did to them, it's something they did to themselves by poor management, by poor realization of constantly building brand new buildings rather than rehabbing old buildings when the case comes up. You have to realize that we actually have record funding for higher education. We have like over 1.3 billion, I think coming forward in fiscal year 2025. This would be on top of that. In just the five years, six years that I've been here, higher education has gone from roughly 800 million up to, up to the $1.3 billion status. I mean, it, it is not for a lack of funding that these colleges, these institutions are, are in this particular predicament. You know, they make choices. You know, they could have allocated their budgets in years gone by in different methods, and, and they would not be facing this problem, or certainly not to the extent that they are. I don't think that in an era where we are already improving record budgets, where particularly we've had a record budget, rec record budgetary spending, say general fund budgetary spending, for higher education, that we should be on top of that, throwing another $36 million for the next six years, you know, a $200 million total package. I think this is to the point of being reckless. It's certainly beyond what the people in my district, I mean, if I go around and look at people's houses and I go around and look at college campuses in the state of Kansas, I think the college campuses have a lot better buildings than what the taxpayers do uh, across the state. And I urge you to vote no on Senate Bill 18. Thank you. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would uh, encourage the previous representative to look out the window at the docking building. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, move that we adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 18. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 18. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. Has every member had the opportunity to record their vote? The clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Representative Chuck Smith votes aye. Members will be in their seats. Any other changes? Seeing none, with 86 having voted in favor and 37 against the passage of Senate Bill 18, the same having received a constitutional majority of the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. The speaker recognizes Representative Berquist for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 384. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senate Bill 384 comes back to the body after being returned to committee uh, for more consideration. Uh, some changes were made. Um, there's a verbiage change that uh, allows, as I will read as follows, the body, uh, the board shall not require any ground vehicle providing interfacility transfers from any county with a population of 30,000 or less to operate with more than one person that satisfies the requirement of subsection B, which is an EMT, if the driver of such vehicle is certified in cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So a change was made from a, a city of 50,000 to a county of 30,000, which lowered the lowered the requirement down to the smaller counties that are, are most appropriately met by this 
this measure. And so I, I believe, we believe that that was the closest we were gonna come to an agreement uh, in the committee. Uh, there were some other uh, things that were not, we were not able to address, but uh, the concerns that were uh, met in the, in the vote earlier, were, we did what we could. Um, we also included SB 162, which is the nuisance abatement law that uh, was uh, similar to 362, which was Sedgwick County's um, uh, sunset uh, provision. And the sunset provision would be for Crawford County and Riley County. And that is, that is also part of this bill. Mr. Speaker, I uh, move the, uh, the adoption of the conference committee report and I would stand for questions. Speaker recognizes Representative Featherston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the speaker did a fine job explaining the bill and I appreciate the negotiations that took place between both the Senate and the House. Um, I'd like to point out that I was one of four people who voted against this bill the first time. It is my general position to oppose any attempts by the legislature to establish health policy. I prefer to leave that in the hands of the professionals. However, thanks to the changes made to the bill, I do now support this bill. The standards we are setting forth are what are currently enacted by the EMS board, which would be a driver with some training and a certified or licensed technician in the back. And I believe if they have set that standard, we can stick with it. I also think I was remiss in uh, not mentioning before, although I mentioned in committee, that um, I would invite all of you and your young people interested in the EMT fields to come to the community college in the center of my district where we have one of the finest EMR, EMT, and paramedic training programs in the state. That just happens to have my husband as one of the medical directors. So I've just like put a shout out for District 16 in my community college, but I do appreciate uh, the negotiations we went through and the compromise we reached, and I appreciate that the professional voices are being respected here, and I do encourage a yes vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Hearing a number of concerns that were given in this body uh, concerning small communities being afraid that we're not going to have the staffing they needed to be able to take care of the emergencies in their community. Uh, I believe we've gone a little ways towards that, and I, I hope that in the in next year and, and in the years to come, we can improve this even more. Mr. Speaker, I move my motion. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 384. The clerk will open the roll, and you may record your vote. Has every member had the opportunity to record their vote? The clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 122 having voted in favor and one against the passage of Senate Bill 384, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. Speaker recognizes Representative Sutton for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 356. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senate Bill 356 is a combination of five insurance bills, four of which you're going to be very familiar with and probably not extremely excited by. Uh, the, the fifth one's cool, though, so pay attention. Um, SB 338 is the first one in there. That's the group-funded liability 
and group funded workers compensation pools. Uh, we just modified some reporting requirements uh, uh, for those that passed the House uh, on 3 7 at 103 to 17. Uh, Senate Bill 339 was the risk based capital version update. We do it every year, there's nothing exciting here. Um, that also passed the House 3 7, uh, 103 to 17. Senate Bill 356, the base bill, uh, changed the per diem amounts and expenses uh, for outside consulting and, and data processing fees and pro rata funding uh, for examination equipment. The, the only sticking point between the House and the Senate on that one was the uh, language of, of reasonable. Uh, the House had the uh, more legally defined term of average and, reason and reasonable. The Senate, in their wisdom, uh, went along with the House language on that. Uh, so that one passed the House 109 to 11. Uh, HB 2663, it's kind of interesting, it allowed the real-time submission of escrow settlement and closing funds. Uh, so that one passed the House uh, 222 at 119 to 0. Now, SB 553, this is one that we have not seen. Uh, it did pass through the, the Senate on the, both the committee and the floor, but it didn't get over here. The base bill wasn't all that interesting. It was allowing electronic delivery of plan documents and identification cards for health benefit plans. Nothing to be really fired up about there, but there was an amendment in committee there that I thought was really interesting and, and really gave me pause. I had to, to uh, really review and, and think about this one. It amended the establishment of electronic portals or the, the requirement of requirement of the establishment of electronic portals for prior authorization. Now, this is matching, after I did some research, this is actually matching what is coming in federal law. And in their committee, they changed the date of implementation uh, for the federal, currently the, the federal plan is supposed to go into effect January of 2027. Uh, because there could be changes made in the Fed's plans, and, and we recognize that, uh, they moved the, the inaction date on the state level to January of 2028. Uh, and, and this process was, was kind of neat. When we're dealing with prior authorization, that's a real sticking point between some of the health providers and some of the insurance providers. And, and the, uh, the committee on the Senate side, I've got to commend them. They don't always do great work over there on, on the east side, but this committee did a good job. They had everyone at the table. They had the insurance providers and the health providers, and they came out with this legislation. And I think, you know, we, can't, we can't guarantee this, but I think we're going to see some of the, some of the issues with prior authorization uh, solved through this legislation. I'm really anxious. Uh, to see what does come about, uh, but we're going to obviously have to wait until it's, it's uh, in effect to see how many of the prior authorization uh, problems that this cures. But I think we are going to be taking a step in the right direction. Uh, so for that reason, I would urge your support for SB3, the conference committee report for SB356, and I'll stand for questions. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Neighbor. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Carrying the Bell did a great job, but I do have a question on clarification sure. that came during our caucus, and that is that some offices or clinics or whatever do not presently have the capability to do some of the electronic work. Are they going to be required, or are they going to be able to still function? That's an excellent question. The real onus on this legislation is on is in the hands of the insurance providers. Um, if you're saying that the medical clinics and hospitals don't have access to the internet, uh, that could be a real sticking point for them. But that would have to be the case in order for it to be an issue. The portal is being designed, maintained, uh, and and uh, uh, utilized by the insurance providers. So that tells us that they will be responsible for setting up these portals. These the, the portals. Insurance company will, right. Yes. Okay. Correct. Uh, with that, uh, 
body, I ask for your support on Senate Bill 356. We did have a good conversation, and I think this is a good bill. Thank you. Representative Helgerson. If the carrier could stand for a question. Thank you very much, and thank you for your work. Um, I didn't understand it completely. So healthcare, the Senate has pulled together insurers and healthcare providers to, what was that again? Did you say, describe? Well, well, it was an amendment on the, on the base bill, which was innocuous in itself. But the, the, they pulled them together to discuss the implementation of you know, how to implement this uh, a prior authorization access point, access portal. And, and that's, that's what that amendment is all about. So if insurers and healthcare providers have prior authorization and an item is cost effective and will reduce money and save the lives of individuals, we should be doing that. I would certainly think that would be a good a step in the right direction, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I, I just mentioned that because later on we'll have a discussion a little bit about uh, second tests for women that have cancer, I believe, and how the House decided to take it out and the Senate decided to take it out rather than spend the $75,000 to save the lives of women and to give them a better life. I mention that now because we'll have a longer conversation tonight about it. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to adopt the conference committee report of SB 356. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 356. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. As every member had the opportunity to record their vote. Clerk will close the roll. Representative Rajas votes aye. Representative Turk votes aye. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 118 having voted in favor and five against the passage of Senate Bill 356, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. Speaker recognizes Representative Thomas for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 73. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Uh, body Senate Bill 73 is current year funding with regards to the enrollment and the way student uh, base state aid is calculated. This bill will allow growing districts to utilize current year funding, current year enrollment counts uh, for state aid, and will also allow the use of the previous year's enrollment. Um, there was a little bit, we passed this bill off the floor, we passed this language last year, and there was a little bit of heartburn about going to this immediately. So this was amended that will allow in the 24-25 school year districts to utilize previous two-year average before the 25-26 school year, where it will be current year and previous year for purposes of uh, state aid. And with that, I will happily stand for questions. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Stogsdill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, previous representative did a good job of, of uh, explaining this bill. It does give school districts more uh, flexibility as far as determining enrollment uh, for funding and so on, and I would highly encourage you to support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move adoption of the conference committee report. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 73. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. As every member had the opportunity to record their vote. The clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 120 having voted in favor and three against the passage of Senate Bill 73, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote.
The speaker recognizes Representative Thomas for a motion to adopt the Agree to Disagree report for Senate Bill 438. Morning, body. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. I move the, uh, to adopt the Agree to Disagree Conference Committee report and then a new conference committee be appointed. But first, I'll explain well, the bill because that's what the sheet tells me to. Uh, this was a conference committee report um, that started with the base bill, the AOK bill, which was carried almost unanimously on the floor. Uh, we added a couple pieces to it. The HEROES Act legislation that passed almost unanimously, uh, the nursing scholarship uh, expansion bill, which was 2645, which passed almost unanimously. We also added House Bill 2731, which had to do with the state board and reporting requirements. Um, and then the blueprint for literacy piece, which is a big piece of it. Um, that the Senate passed, we passed it out of our committee uh, with several requested amendments from the proponents. Um, and uh, what that basically does is it starts, there's Regency Centers for Reading, it adds a $500 stipend per teacher who gets their certification in the science of reading. Um, it's basically a bill that focuses on making sure teachers know how to teach reading so our kids can be better off. So with that, I'll happily stand here and answer questions. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Stogsdale. And the former representative did a good job of uh, describing the bill. Uh, unfortunately, I was the disagree and the agree to disagree. And uh, uh, there's some very good parts of this bill. This bill should have been separated. Uh, and uh, uh, had some very good things about scholarships for teachers, nurses, so on like that, but it also uh, certainly uh, took rights and responsibilities away from uh, the State Board of Education and our local boards of education and put those responsibilities and rights in the, in the uh, uh, legislature here. And uh, last week we had a couple of representatives that came to the uh, uh, podium here and pointed out that the, uh, correctly, pointed out that the State Board of Education is not a member of the uh, uh, Kansas legislature. It's not a member of the judiciary. It's not a member of the, of the executive branch. It is totally separate. Uh, those people are elected to do a job by the same people who elect us to do a job. And it seems like every year we come back and uh, uh, try to take over their responsibilities and put those into the uh, into the legislature here, and I would highly object to that. I think most teachers, administrators, school board members, and so on would also agree with that. So uh, I uh, would like to go back and, and uh, try to iron that out. So thank you very much. Representative Chuck Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted you to know that uh, Representative Aaron Coleman a couple years ago is eligible for this hero scholarship. He called me the other night and he was real excited about that. And, and uh, he's trying to make life better for himself. So we voted for that 120 to zero. So I'm real happy for Aaron. And if you ever get a chance, I hope you congratulate him and encourage him to go on and have a good life. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. I do think it's worth pointing out that when the State Board adopts policies and we codify them into law, I don't understand why that would be an issue. So with that, um, I move to adopt the Agree to Disagree Conference Committee report and then a new conference committee be appointed. You've heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The eyes appear to have it. The, the eyes do have it. And the motion passes. The speaker appoints Representative Thomas, Estes, and Stogsdill as conferees on part of the House. Representatives Thomas, Estes, and Stogsdill are appointed to replace Representatives Sutton, Penn, and Neighbor as conferees on Senate Bill 19. Messages from the governor, the clerk will read. 
House bills 2590, 2604, 2605, 2632, 2661, and 2783 have been signed. Approved April 4th, 2024. Laura Carley, Governor. Are there announcements? Speaker recognizes Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, House elections and Senate, Fed, and State will conference immediately upon uh, recess uh, on House Bills 2614, 2618. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pro Tem, House Judiciary and Senate Judiciary will also conference immediately following recess in room 582. Thank you. Representative Stogsdill. Democrats will have agenda meeting at 4 o'clock, room 152 South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further announcements, the speaker recognizes the majority leader for a motion to recess. Oh, Representative Robinson. Thank you. I forgot, I did not, okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, we have a resolution uh, commemorating the 70th anniversary of Brown versus Topeka which is taking place the 18th of May, and we have a resolution. I don't know if I'm supposed to read this entire resolution or share it, but the people that would like to co-sponsor the resolution have a copy of it. And I apologize for hitting the wrong button or not hitting it at all. Thank you very much. Seeing no further announcements, the speaker recognizes the majority leader for a motion to recess. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Calendar, uh, Republicans will calendar at 4 p.m. Mr. Speaker, I move the House stand in recess until 5 p.m. You've all heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The House is in recess.
The house will be in order. Messages from the Senate. The clerk will read. The Senate adopts the Conference Committee Report on Senate Bill 455. The Senate announced the appointment of Senators Peck, Glaze, and Holland to replace Senators Longbine, Fag, and Holscher as conferees on House Bill 2097. The Senate adopts the Conference Committee Report, agree to disagree on Senate Bill 438, and has appointed Senators Baumgartner, Erickson, and Sykes as second conferees on part of the Senate. The Senate adopts the Conference Committee Report to agree to disagree on Senate substitute for House Bill 2070, and has appointed Senators Warren, Wilborn, and Corson as second conferees on part of the Senate. The Senate adopts the Conference Committee Report on Senate substitute for House Bill 2036. The Senate announced the appointment of Senators Erickson, Dietrich, and Sykes to replace Senators Longmine, Pegg, and Holscher as Senate conferees on Senate Bill 19. The Senate adopts the Conference Committee Report report on, on bills, Senate Bill 359, House Bill 2532, House Bill 2560, House Bill 2711, and House Bill 2787. The speaker recognizes Representative Kincannon for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 115. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, Bobby, this is the um, Child Advocate Act. Um, the long-awaited op Office of the Child Advocate. Is, this bill has had a long history. Last year, we passed it 116 to 7. We started conferencing on this last year. Kind of things kind of fell apart, so we resumed this year and um, had some good negotiations. But the House passed one bill, the Senate passed another, and so we were trying to um, put the two bills together, and that just took a little while. Um, there were a lot of things that both bills had. It, it gave the office um, independence um, and freedom uh, from political influence, uh, the ability to track and respond to different trends um, in in. To, that will improve the system. Some of the differences is we took, we took our position, uh, the House position on the qualifications um, for the child advocate. Um, we had a difference in the definition of a child. And uh, so our, our position, we took the House position, which was uh, consistent with the sync code. Um, the, uh, the Senate was pretty firm on uh, asking for subpoena power. And uh, after much debate, we, we accepted that with, with guardrails um, and we established uh, some, a time frame and some, some specifics about procedure. Um, what else? Um, there, there was a lot of discussion between confidentiality and absolute privilege. Uh, we, we, are, we went with the uh, confidentiality um, and immunity. Um, there was a lot of technical stuff that we cleaned up that made it consistent with the uh, with the sync code. Um, and then f the final um, move that we made was to this was a bill that had another bill amended into it. So we asked to have everything removed, and and it, they accepted that. And then we accepted their. Um, appointment process, which will be the governor appoints with um, Senate approval. So, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt the conference committee report. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Owsley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, for those of you that have been here a while, I appreciate your patience while we work through this with the Senate. I commend my chair. I commend my vice chair on our negotiations. The compromise really took a while, but I feel like we've got a good product here. And uh, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm a little bit proud to present to you all the uh, conference committee report on SB 115. And I hope you will uh, support this motion. I think it's a step in the right direction. And... Uh, something necessary for the kids in the state of Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Mr. Speaker, pro tem.
Before I close, I just wanted to say thank you to my vice chair and, and also to um, the ranking member who has worked on this for six years. Um, I've worked on it for a long time, for four years, but um, I really have to commend him. It took a couple years for him to bring me along. Uh, and, and so I, I ask for um, your support and I close on my motion. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 115. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. As every member had the opportunity to record their vote. The clerk will close the roll. Seeing 10 hands, calls in order. Dorman will secure the doors. Clerk will read the roll. Representatives Alcala, Garber, Hauser, Landwehr, Potter Parcel, and Wassinger. Representative Wassinger votes aye. Not seeing 10 hands, calls raised. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 117 having voted in favor and three against, the passage of Senate Bill 115, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. The speaker recognizes Representative Proctor for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 14. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, body, Senate Bill 14 uh, contains two bills. Uh, the first one is House Bill 2512, which passed out of this uh, chamber earlier this uh, session, 97 to 23. What that bill does is in 2024, it requires that clerks uh, add four hours on Saturday of early voting, the Saturday before an election. And uh, in 2025, it ends the uh, uh, Monday early voting by noon and moves the deadline back to 7 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, this bill uh, was uh, drafted and uh, constructed in coordination with the Clerks Association, because a lot of our, our rural clerks, especially those offices that are uh, one or two man or woman bands, uh, it's really tough for them to continue to do early voting um, up till noon, reset all the poll books and get all their polling places often many, many miles away from uh, the county seat uh, ready for election day. The other bill that's in this, in this bill is House Bill 2513, which removes the three-day grace period. Uh, I want to talk for a minute about why uh, I brought this bill. 
and uh, why I'm before you today talking about it. So we passed the, a similar measure uh, last year. It was vetoed by the governor, and we didn't have the votes to override. And I was ready to just drop the issue and uh, not bring it back. But in the fall, uh, I went around to a bunch of election offices, including uh, rural election office. And we had heard during the debate of the three-day grace period that zero ballots were being counted in rural counties after election day. And so I asked this clerk, so you didn't get any ballots? And she said, no, we got ballots. We couldn't count any of them because they weren't postmarked. The statute in Kansas says that if a ballot shows up after Election Day during that three-day grace period and it's not postmarked, um, it can't be counted. And so we are disenfranchising hundreds, maybe thousands of rural voters. We won't know the exact number until the, the end of this election, 2024, because the Secretary of State's office is going to be collecting data on it. But we are disenfranchising voters who did everything right. They requested their ballot correctly, they filled out their ballot correctly, they put it in the mail and got it to their election office by three days after election day, but we can't count their ballot because the post office didn't postmark the ballot. If we do away with the three-day grace period, then we don't, the ballot doesn't have to be postmarked because you know it was cast before 7 p.m. on election night. What this bill does, in addition, is it adds two days of early voting. So early voting will begin 22 days before the election rather than 20 days before the election. It adds two days for voters with mail-in ballots because now instead of the mail-in ballots going out at 20 days, the mail-in ballots will go out at 22 days. Another thing that it does is it moves the deadline to, requi to request a mail-in ballot back a week because right now, we, only have, we let you continue to request a mail-in ballot until six days before the election. That, there's no way the election office is going to get your ballot, you your ballot through the mail, and you're going to get it back by the deadline. So it moves that date back. Um, the uh, House Bill 2512, the moving the Monday, includes the amendment that the minority leader brought during the debate to uh, give election officers the leeway on a case-by-case -case basis to allow someone to vote on Monday if extenuating circumstances should occur. And um, I think I'll stop there and uh, stand for questions. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Woodard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The carrier of the conference committee report did a great job explaining what's in the bill. Um, this was one that we had to agree to disagree on. Uh, I think the biggest sticking point, while I appreciate the addition of the two uh, days on the front end of early voting and, and mail ballots going out two days earlier, um, it is, especially being from a larger county, getting rid of that three-day grace period uh, in 2023 in Johnson County and in 2022 was an average of 4,800 votes that came in in the grace period. And so that's a number of votes that would not be counted if we were to enact this law. Um, I do, for the record, want to make it very clear to Kansans that if they're going to get their mail ballot, it's much quicker to put it in a ballot drop box than it is going to go through the mail process. Um, but as we've had discussions about this in the past, when you are mailing um, a ballot, it is leaving the state of Kansas to go to a processing center before it's gonna come back to go to your county election office. Um, I do appreciate the addition of the early voting days. I appreciate the um, moving up the deadline to request a ballot just because, as the chair said, um, if you're requesting a ballot, there are many folks that are successfully requesting it within the timeline. It's not making it to them before the election day. And so, um, but with the underlying piece of this being the elimination of the three-day grace period, that's just too many votes. Um, that would not be counted. I, I do appreciate the conversation that we had with the county election officers and county clerks. For in those instances where they are having ballots come in without ballot postmarks, I would also want to work with the county clerks to make sure that they're talking to their postmaster, that they're talking to their post office to make sure that they are postmarking ballots. Um, you know, if, if there is a case where there's 100 coming in and there's not a single postmark, that's less a problem about 
one, we don't have any control over the USPS, but also want to make sure that our county clerks have a relationship with their postmaster to encourage them to go to make sure that those ballots are getting postmarked as well. So um, probably no surprise to my chair, I'll be voting no and would urge the body to vote against the CCR for Senate Bill 14. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For further discussion, the speaker recognizes Minority Leader Vic Miller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With my friend from Leavenworth, you'll do a couple of questions. That was one. Um, you said you visited some counties and spoke with county clerks. About, I'm talking about the uh, three-day grace period issue. That is true, yes. And how many of those counties... How many of those county election officers did you speak to? Um, I spoke to the four, um, the four election commissioners for the four largest counties. I spoke to the, uh, the uh, Rick Pivo, who's the uh, uh, Harvey County clerk, and I spoke to the Wabansi County clerk, Abby Amy. And I spoke to the Lovemore clerk. RV Leavenworth, who was the third one? Uh, well, well, let's, see. let's see. And then, yeah. And did you get the same story from all of them that they were having trouble with mail not being postmarked? Um, it, it varied by county. The larger counties had less of a problem. The more urban counties had less of a problem. Uh, they do get ballots that are not postmarked in those counties as well. And were you able to, was that, Anecdotal evidence, or did you observe the these ballot envelopes that were not postmarked? Um, I did not observe them, but uh, I talked to the election officer, and I, I trust the election officers would uh, not lie about something like that. Well, I wouldn't say they. I, I wouldn't allege that they were lying. I think uh, I do think there's some misunderstanding about how some of these ballots are, or the envelopes are postmarked. As I understand, many of them are postmarked by use of a barcode. And I'm not sure every election officer understands that. Uh, but personally, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I agree with my ranking member that if there if there is a county having a a problem with their post office not postmarking ballots, first of all, I don't understand why that would be occurring. Um, I don't know about any of you, I've never gotten a piece of mail that wasn't postmarked. So I think some further investigation of that issue uh, requires, is required. When this bill passed in 2017, it was passed because of service from the post office suffering. It is safe to say that since the bill passed, and the whole purpose of the bill was to address the fact that delivery was suffering, the, it's gotten worse. Anyone that I talk to is contemplating mailing their ballot, I tell them, please mail it as soon as you can to ensure that it gets there. I think the point was well taken that the drop boxes are a better alternative to ensure that it's taken on time. Nonetheless, if someone chooses to utilize the post office, it's not their fault if the post office is dilatory in delivering it. And they should not be disenfranchised by taking away this grace period. It's too bad that we had a bill that I supported that was initiated to assist the clerks in the timely processing of elections by granting them some additional free time on Monday to do things other than process early votes. And I thought that was a good idea and I appreciate the chair uh, receiving my amendment as a friendly amendment to tie up a little bit of a hole in that process. I do appreciate that. And it's sad for me that we took a good bill that was aimed at helping the clerks and we've let the politicians amend it such that I cannot support it. And I, again, if the 
bill reaches the governor's desk, we'll implore her to please exercise her pen to veto it so that these people who do benefit from that three days, and there are literally tens of thousands of voters that do continue to enjoy that privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. You know, it's, it's not often that we as a body take away the opportunity for people to vote. We've always considered it a rite of passage. We encourage people to vote. And yet here we are, the carrier of the uh, amendment or the bill said he had been in contact with several small rural areas. We have 105 counties, 105. And yet we heard some of the big ones who were not in favor of it and about four small ones. That's not even 50% or 25% of the counties or the people in Kansas. I would dare say if you went home and said, I took your right away on those three days, you might get a little flack. And you get flack that is correct. Because why are we paying or why are our citizens being hung out to dry? Because the post office cannot do their job. Our current postmaster is the one that shut down several sorting places. That has diminished and caused a lot of problem for people across the United States. They don't get their meds on time. They may not get their bills on time. Oh, they pay them, but they don't get to the uh, company on time, and so they're charged interest. I've gotten mail that wasn't postmarked. In fact, I could take and reuse that stamp. Is it right? No, but I bet you all have at one time or another. They're not doing their job, but why should the voters of Kansas or anywhere else have to suffer because a department cannot do their job? This. The first part of this bill is good, but this part of it is horrible. Absolutely horrible. And if you want to disenfranchise voters, go ahead. But I think it will be important that we spread the word. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I could not agree more with uh, one thing that the previous speaker said, which is we should not be disenfranchising voters because the postmark, the post office is failing to do its job and postmark ballots, which is why if we do away with the three-day grace period, we will. it won't matter if the ballot is postmarked because you know, unless they got in a time machine and mailed it back from uh, the next Tuesday, that that ballot was cast by 7 p.m. on election day. That's why, that's why we're here today. Um, and we do have data. Last session, the Secretary of State told us that zero ballots were counted in rural counties after election day in that three-day grace period. So we know that, uh, you know, I do, it is a small sample right now, but when the Secretary of State is collect, collects data for this election, which they've already asked the clerks to give them the data on, we are going to find out that we are disenfranchising hundreds, if not thousands, of rural voters and voters in, in uh, urban districts as well because not all of the ballots are getting postmarked. Um, I'd like to answer a couple other concerns that I heard very quickly uh, as I was talking to folks about this bill. The first concern I heard was, well, because you're moving the voter registration back 22 to 23 days before instead of 21 days, you're effectively, because that's a Sunday, moving it back to Friday. 
I've talked to the Secretary of State's office. If you register online by any means by that Sunday, your registration will be valid. If you mail in your registration and it has a postmark, and that postmarks before that Sunday, your registration will be valid. There is a federal law, the NVRA, NVRA which requires that if a election office receives a voter registration request that isn't postmarked, they have to accept it if it arrived within 10 days of the election. So this has no impact um, beyond the two days that we intended to move voter registration because you have to have everybody registered before you start early voting. The second thing, the governor, when she vetoed this bill, a similar bill last year without those two extra days, said that she was doing it because military personnel were being disenfranchised. The UACAVA, the federal law on overseas and uniform voting, requires that we get them their ballot 45 days before the election and requires that their mail-in ballot be in by election night. So this bill has, just like the last bill, has zero impact on military voters. And I'll wrap up by saying Kansas is lying to voters. Not intentionally, but we are lying to voters. When we tell voters that they can request their mail-in ballot six days before the election and they're gonna get it in time and be able to get it back in time, that's a lie. That's not true. That is just not feasible with today's mail system. We are lying to voters, a lot of voters, when we tell them that if you get your ballot into the election office, within three days after the election, we'll go ahead and count it. Because many, many, many of those ballots are coming in without postmarks and we're not counting them. We're disenfranchising many more people and the numbers will come back. When the numbers come back, I hope that the folks that were opposing this because they said I only had anecdotal evidence will be in support of this measure when we find out that we're disenfranchising hundreds or thousands of voters. So, Mr. Speaker, with that, I move to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 14. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 14. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. As every member had the opportunity to record their vote, the clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 73 having voted in favor and 48 against the passage of Senate Bill 14, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. The speaker recognizes Representative Tarwater for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 271. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senate Bill 271 was the uh, drone bill that we passed not too long ago. We made a couple of changes. The first thing we did was uh, add some language from a finance bill that passed that same day uh, that prohibits a state from count contracting with foreign principals to purchase goods and services. It didn't fit in the bill that it was in, so we moved it over to the drone bill because it, it made better sense there. We also, to protect the fiscal note, uh, uh, when we reimburse for a drone that we take from the uh, law enforcement, we uh, will depreciate it over time so that um, we can uh, save a little bit on the fiscal note. They have about a seven year uh, shelf life is what we understand. And we are depreciating it 1.5% a month, which would match that. So with that, I'll stand for questions. Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt the conference committee report. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Probst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, chairman of our Commerce Committee did a fine job explaining this. Uh, basically, I would say we didn't make too many big changes in uh, conference, nothing that causes me much concern, um, and it was explained very well. I'd say if you didn't like this before, you probably still don't like it, and if you did like it, uh, you'll like it. Um, I personally 
don't think it's going to accomplish what we think. And we did create a new fund that I suspect will last for a long time and cost a lot of money. But I'll, I voted for it, and I'll do that same thing again. Representative Tarwater, you may close. Thank you, sir. I close. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 271. The clerk will open the roll, and you may record your vote. Has every member had the opportunity to record their vote? The clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Representative Hoheisel votes aye. Representative Helgerson votes no. Are there any further changes? Seeing none. With 86 having voted in favor and 35 against, the passage of Senate Bill 2, members will be in their seats. Having received the Constitution majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. Clerk will record the vote. Now you can get up. Speaker recognizes Representative Sutton for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 423. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. SB 423 only combines four bills. So we don't have to be nearly as nervous about this one. Um, <clears throat> all, all four of these have passed the House. Senate Bill 4, uh, H HB 2530 is the first one. Uh, that removes Automobile Club from the definition of human. Not a, not a huge stretch there. That was uh, passed by the House at 118 to 2. Apparently, two people think that uh, automobile clubs are humans. Um, HB 2715 is putting an up to in certain fees so that the uh, insurance commissioner has the authority to reduce those fees if, if, uh, uh, if it's possible, uh, or prudent, rather. Um, that wouldn't pass the House 119 to zero. Senate Bill 423 uh, was regarding the Committee on Surety Bonds and Insurance Governing Boards, just adjusting the number of board members and the frequency of their meetings. Again, not terribly exciting, but it passed the House 122 to 1. Now, here's the one that might be a sticking point. HB 2834 is included in this package. Uh, this is the one that transferred the state employee health plan from the Department of Administration to the insurance department. Uh, as you'll recall, four years ago, we moved the uh, state employee health plan from the uh, KDHE to the uh, Department of Administration, thinking that the person who handled benefits or the agency that handled benefits uh, would be best able to handle the, uh, the uh, health plan. Since then, we've found that maybe that's not the best match, and so we're looking at the insurance department to handle the insurance program. Seems like a better match, and I think we're going to have more success with that. Uh, that one passed the House 81 to 42. Uh, overall, regarding SB 423 Conference Committee report, I'd say if you liked HB 2834 before, you probably still do. If you didn't like it before, you probably still don't. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. The uh, carrier of the bill um, did an excellent job of describing it to you. The, um, the two parts in here, or the th three parts, are good bills. But the last one, in my purview, is something that we jumped at a little bit too quickly. And the reason I sign the agree to disagree is because I think everybody needs to hear their vote or their voice heard. Uh, I don't like the bill. And so in essence, I will be voting against it. And the reason for that is um, this bill was brought at the last minute around March the 8th. 
we um, we had discussion on it. There were only three proponents, only three. One was a group who um, has had trouble getting insurance to pay. They thought maybe they'd get something different with this. The other was a representative, and then there was a written only. That's not a lot of support for taking something that Alvarez put in their report as a need for efficiency. And the department has shown efficiencies have taken place. They did just what Alvarez said. One of the things we need to remember is that the insurance is a policy, and I repeat, policy agency. It doesn't give out claims and, and master those, even though you would say, oh, insurance. That's not what they do. The Department of Administration also presented in their opposition testimony the fact that they had just recently put out a bid for some IT uh, equipment that involved this very department and that if we were to change it, they would have to take that back and redo that bid. There was conversation that the insurance department recently moved. We all know that. The issue was, do they have enough room? Oddly enough, we've had two different reports, and both of them have come from the insurance department. One of them says, yes, we have the room, and the other one says, no, we don't. So if it turns out they do not have the room to facilitate this group, they're going to have to look for a new location, and they will be moving. So if you look at the physical impact, which we don't have a complete breakdown here because it's not possible to get it at this point. We may just be erasing all of those efficiencies. I don't know why we do these reports if we don't take them seriously, especially when they've done their job and they've proven to be efficient. That's why on this particular bill, I stand opposed to HB 2715 because I think it's a matter of, I think it's 2715. I think um, that that is a matter that we, it's 2834, sorry. That is a matter that we need to take very seriously. And um, because if we're gonna start moving departments every four years, we're never gonna make any headway on efficiencies or anything else. I would appreciate a no vote. The other bills in here, I want you to know because I've asked the insurance department. They do not cover dates or any any uh, guidelines from federal government or NIAC. They are things the insurance department would like to have, but they're not going to suffer anything if they don't pass until next year. So I've cleared that because I didn't want to jeopardize anything that would put us in harm's way as far as the agency goes. So thank you, and I ask for a no vote on that one. Representative Featherston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I stand opposed to this bill because it is a horrible idea to move the state employee health plan to the insurance commission. Now, I think we can probably most all agree our current insurance commissioner does a fabulous job. I think you'll find people voted and donated to her campaign on both sides of this aisle and feel very confident in her abilities. This is not about that. What this is about is a gross conflict of interest that would be created for you and your families and your constituents that are on the state employee health plan. You would be asking the insurance commission to both negotiate your plan and then 
enforce the plan if something didn't go your way, which as I understand it from testimony is why we are here today. So that, not good. When you look at the Insurance Commission website, it says their job is to regulate, educate, and advocate. They are there to be the people's advocate. They are not there to perform HR functions, which we do have a department that does that called the Department of Administration. Now, I ask you to look down the road a little bit. The insurance commissioner is a highly qualified woman who perhaps might look to move on to another job. And maybe we would find somebody in one of our legislative chambers who would think, I would be really good at being the insurance commissioner. I could really get some stuff done. Okay, what if that person won that job, didn't think that preventive life-saving and cost-saving health care was worth $1.63 per policy? What if that person from one of our legislative chambers did not think your wife, your sister, your mother, your daughter, or yourself was worth a dollar sixty-three to your health plan to potentially save their life, but to most certainly save health care costs. What if they didn't think that catching two or three cases of breast cancer was worth saving $155,000 at a cost of $75,000. I think that's maybe something we should think about, who we want to be our advocate for our and our family's insurance needs. Thank you. Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A couple of things that came up there. First off, uh, the insurance department currently handles customer service for all insurance companies. Uh, whenever there's a problem, they're the ones who take the calls. And as you may note, uh, that's one of the majority, one of the major concerns that we're currently having with our state employee health plan is not responding to customer complaints and concerns. Um, also, regarding the A&M study, that thing uh, cost us about three to four million dollars, probably the biggest boondoggle ever. Um, I don't think we've still, even by now, saved the amount of money that it cost. So uh, I'm not sure that I would, I would uh, call that a strong efficiency. Uh, with that all said, Mr. Speaker, I do move to adopt the conference committee report on Senate Bill 423. This constitutes final action on Senate Bill 423. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. As every member had the opportunity to record their vote, the clerk will close the roll. Does any member desire to explain his or her vote? Does any member desire to change his or her vote? Seeing none, with 80 having voted in favor and 41 against the passage of Senate Bill 423, the same having received a constitutional majority, the bill is hereby declared passed. The clerk will record the vote. The speaker recognizes Representative Adam Smith for a motion to adopt the conference committee report on House Bill 2036. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Senate substitute for House Bill 2036 contains uh, the following measures. It is a reduction in the top marginal individual income tax rate from 5.7 down to 5.5. It is a, an exemption on Social Security benefit, income tax on your Social Security benefits uh, effective immediately. It increases the standard deduction amounts in tax code for single filers from 3,500 to 5,000, for head of household from 6,000 to 7,500, 
and for married filers or joint filers from 8,000 up to $10,000. This does also increase the child and dependent care tax credit to 100% of the federal, uh, federal deductible amount. This reduces the privilege tax rates that banks pay and financial institutions pay uh, proportionately to the corporate rate reduction in the APEX language uh, that we passed several years ago. This does abolish the local ad valorem tax reduction fund and the city county revenue sharing fund. It does not abolish the city county, the special city county highway fund. This does increase the amount of the residential exemption on your appraised value of your, your property from 42,000 currently in statute up to $100,000 and it reduces the statewide mill levy from 20 mills down to 19.5. This also accelerates the elimination of the sales tax, state sales tax on food to zero effective July 1st. With that, Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt the conference committee report on the Senate substitute for House Bill 2036 and I'll stand for questions. For discussion, the speaker recognizes Representative Owens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, any time that I have the opportunity to come up to this well, I truly count it an honor. Each one of us, regardless of what party affiliation we are, was elected by the majority of our constituents. They're ultimately who we're accountable to. I spoke first at this well about six years ago now, and I vowed to do what was right for them, not what was right for me, not what was right for my reelection campaign. Not too long ago, matter of fact, last week, our body came together in a rare display of unanimous consent for some of us, it was a huge victory. For some of us, it was a huge disappointment. But the reality is we came together, united, and we sent a tax bill across the rotunda that took care of many Kansans. Everybody benefited, the lower tiers, property tax, social security tax elimination, a bill that every member of this body could unite behind, and we sent it to the Senate, and they trashed it. Now, there may be reasons, I don't know, and to be quite honest, I don't care. But the bill that we're presented here today is inferior on so many levels. Now, some may have a different reason for agreeing with this, and some may have another reason for disagreeing with it. But the reality is, Kansans deserve better. Kansans deserve a tax bill that represents true savings in their pocket. And that bill was the bill that was sent across the rotunda, unanimously. And so, Mr. Speaker, I make a substitute motion to not adopt the conference committee report and that a new conference committee be appointed. The speaker recognizes, the speaker recognizes Speaker Hawkins. Now that is kind of funny, isn't it? The speaker recognizes Speaker Hawkins. You know, uh, today, you have a decision to make. You have a decision to make if you're going to... Well, let me back up. Let me back up just a little bit. Actually, I love some of the things that the previous speaker said. Um, we did have quite a day uh, when we passed 
Senate Bill 300 across this body. That was that was a that was a glorious day for so many of us. And and I think if we hadn't had Senate Bill 300, we wouldn't look at this bill quite the way we look at it today. We would probably look at it as you know something we're trimming two tenths of a percent off of the top rate, which for some of you would say, yeah, that's the wrong thing for, uh, for us to do. And for others, you would say, that's a great thing to do. The bill we are presented with today has many of the same provisions that our bill had. It has the sales tax on food in there, which my friends on this side absolutely want, not something I wanted. I'd actually kind of like to not have it in there. But in Senate Bill 300, certainly, we compromised on that. It has Social Security tax, or the, the income tax on Social Security completely repealed. I think every single one of us, nah, maybe not every single, but almost all of us, like that provision. My friends over here, a couple of them are smiling. I guess the point, I could go through every single piece of this bill and you're going to say there's something in here I love and there's something in here I hate, something I don't like. Probably for me, only having nine, uh, half a mil taken off is something I don't like. Matter of fact, that would be my hate. That would be the thing that I hate the worst about this bill is the fact that only got a half a mil. But where is actually the tax relief on property tax in this bill? It's actually not in the mills. It's actually in the homestead. The exemption, that 100000 exemption, produces $127 for every person that has a house. Uh, at 100000 it produces $127 in tax relief. The, the, the mills actually, for the lower houses, actually produces very little. And I guarantee you, if I called on, on, on my friend, the, the tax chair or the vice chair, they could tell you exactly how much that is, and it's not very much. So when people say that we're not getting tax relief, you're wrong. We are getting tax relief. This bill is a good bill, just not as good as what we had with Senate Bill 300, and we all know that. So now you have to make a decision, and that's really where we're coming to, is we have to make a decision. Are we going to, are we going to decide, because it doesn't come up to what we love the most a week and a half ago, that we're going to trash it, and we're going to stop everything, and we're going to go home tomorrow evening without a tax bill? Or are we going to say, you know, it's part of the process. This is actually not bad. In fact, pretty much everybody out there is going to get, a ta get tax relief from this, and most people don't know what we know. Most people don't know that we already had the best. We just don't have quite the best today. But we do have great tax relief for our people, and we can go home, and we can say we have tax relief. And they'll feel it. I would venture to say... Matter of fact, I would bet before, before we hit, put our heads down on our pillows tonight, if we send it back, you know what the headline's going to be? House scuttles tax relief for Kansan. Now you get a, yeah, you get to try to message that one. Because I know what the press does. Press ever, they always use the, the most hellacious headline that they can get. How scuttles tax relief. And a single one of us want to scuttle tax relief. We want our folks to get tax relief. And we have the ability to make that decision tonight and not send this back and let's have a debate on the bill that's before us and hopefully pass it and let's go home and deliver tax relief to our constituents who dearly need tax relief. I love every one of you. Every one of you have to make that decision for yourself. But I think truly it's a decision you really need to think about before we finish up tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker recognizes Representative Sawyer.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a little uncomfortable speaking that for the speaker. <laughs> uh, I rise in support of the motion. You know, um, we did really good work in this body last week. Senate Bill 300 was a really good bill. And the Speaker of the House gave a very good speech last week talking about how this body worked together and truly passed a bipartisan bill. It was historic. You know, I've been here a long time. You don't pass big controversial bills like that, 123 to nothing, but we did. That was pretty amazing. And it was good work. And I believe we ought to have the opportunity to go to conference committee and discuss our work with the Senate. And that's the way the process is supposed to work. Our opportunity, we should, we're still gonna be here. You know, we're not adjourning tonight. I think we should send this back, let our conferees sit down with the Senate, let them see how good a work we did last week. Senate Bill 300 is clearly better than this bill. It's broad tax relief for everybody in Kansas. And it's better than the current bill we're working on. I think the work we did deserves that opportunity. This is our chance. This is our chance to sit down and discuss Senate Bill 300 with the Senate. So I would urge you to support this motion to not adopt the conference committee report and a new conference committee be appointed. Speaker recognizes Representative Vic Miller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think there will ever be a better time for me to say this, but I love you too, Mr. Speaker. If you were listening to the speaker a moment ago, he said one very important thing that caught my ear, and that was, if it wasn't for Senate Bill 300, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Mr. Speaker, there was Senate Bill 300. It is real, it exists. It went to the other side, expecting to be treated like we would any other bills that pass between us, and that is given some respect that that was the position of this house. It was totally disrespected. It was never considered. It was never discussed. And we are entitled to at least have them act like they care what our position is. Why anyone would ever want to serve in that chamber is beyond me. Seeing no further discussion, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am truly glad there is so much love here. You know, we just heard from a few folks, and again, nothing in this body is personal, but let's be real. We heard that this isn't a bad tax relief bill. We heard about making sure we get to go home. We heard about headlines. Well, how about this headline? House fights for more tax relief that Kansans deserve. Or maybe it's past time the House finally takes a stand. Folks, today is that day. Let us rise up and be united and send a message that Kansans deserve more. I close. All right, so a yes vote sends this back to conference committee. A no vote keeps this bill on the floor. I will remind the gallery that there is a rule that prohibits any photographs or photography of the boards if a division is called. If you do so, the sergeant of arms will immediately escort you from the gallery. You've all heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 
All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Motion carries. Out of order. The speaker recognizes Representative Humphreys for a motion to adopt the agreed to disagree report, House Bill 2070. The conferees on part of the House for House Bill 2036 are Adam Smith, Burkamp, and Sawyer. Representative Humphreys. This is going to be boring compared to what we just said. Body, um, I am here to talk about House Bill 20, Senate set for House Bill 2070. We had it cross our floor and we voted it across our floor on March 26. It is the third party uh, litigation funding transparency bill. It also has a piece in it to send a report to uh, the Judicial Council and um, with that, Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt the Agree to Disagree Conference Committee report and that a new conference committee be appointed and I will answer any questions. Representative Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Guys, come on. This is my first conference committee report. Please don't kick me off of this. I worked really hard. We are all friends here. We established that in the previous debate. We are all friends. And I think friends can tell friends that this bill 2070 or the substitute motion for the bill 2510 are terrible bills. I'm allowed as a friend to be honest with you. It is a terrible bill and we shouldn't pass it. So again, I guess to quote war, the band, why can't we be friends? 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 Please vote no on this motion to agree to disagree. Thank you. Representative Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we've already heard this bill and we voted it out largely along party lines. Uh, that's why there's an agreement to disagree. And you may recall that one of the uh, objections of those who opposed it was that uh, we really, one of, the, one of the concerns we had in putting the, the bill forward was possibility of what I'll call litigation terrorism, that is foreign countries, entities coming in and using our litigation process to uh, strategically attack businesses, strategic businesses, such as ag or um, aerospace in Kansas. And the opponents said, well, you know, prove that that's actually happening. Prove that Russia or China or North Korea are using that method to undermine our society. I wanted to bring to the attention of the body that on March 28th of this year, a few days ago, Bloomberg reported that a company called A1, uh, which is owned by Russian oligarchs with ties to Putin, have been financing litigations around the world, including in the United States. And uh, there's no reporting. Um, we don't really know. They aren't regulated. They're deep pockets. They're investors. And they can put millions into a case without appearing, it appearing on the court record. And so I think we do now have evidence that they know very well how to and are, in fact, using litigation, third-party litigation funding to invest in and uh, litigate cases around the world. The one case that was reported 
in the Bloomberg was A1, had, they said it had spent $20 million in an ongoing bankruptcy litigation in New York and London. With that, Mr. Speaker, I urge the uh, adoption of the agree to disagree. Representative, you may close. Thank you. I close and move my motion. You've heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Motion passes. The speaker appoints representatives. Humphreys. Representatives Humphreys, Lewis, and Osmond, as conferees and part of the House. Are there announcements? Representative Thomas. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, House Education Conference Committee will meet on Senate Bill 19 at 8 o'clock, room 159 South. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Representative Concannon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow is Wear Blue Day for Child Abuse Prevention Month, and there will be a pinwheel planting event at 930 tomorrow morning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. The House Judiciary, Senate Judiciary will conference in um, 582 immediately after recessing. Representative Ellis. Veterans Committee conference at uh, Fink. 582? I think it's 528 and 710. Seeing no further announcements, the speaker recognizes the majority leader for a motion to recess. Delay my last, Representative Stogstill. Never mind, majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the House recess until 8.30 p.m. You've all heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The House is in recess.
Are there announcements? Speaker recognizes the majority leader for a motion to recess. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Republicans, we will calendar immediately upon uh, recess over in the old Supreme Court. Mr. Speaker, I move the House stand in recess until 9.15 p.m. You've all heard the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. We are adjourned. We are at recess.